So now we're going to talk about action potential phases. And I want to point out that on the y axis here, we have the membrane potential in millivolts. And we see that we have the equilibrium potential for potassium being a negative value, which is what we expect from a cation that has a high concentration on the inside relative to the outside. And we have the equilibrium potential for sodium being a positive number because it's a cation that has a higher concentration on the outside relative to the inside. And the membrane potential at rest under normal conditions here is in close proximity to the EK because of the higher resting conductance or permeability to potassium. And that is from the leaky potassium channels. Notice that the membrane potential is stable, it has a slope of zero over time. And that's because in our simplified model here, the potassium current, which is outward, is equal in magnitude to the inward sodium current. So we put absolute values around here just to say, we're not gonna worry about the sign because potassium currents are positive and sodium currents are negative. So this is just showing that they're balanced. And now we have a depolarizing stimulus coming in here, depolarizing the membrane, causing displacement of those positive charges in the voltage-gated sodium channel protein. And that's gonna cause activation of some of our voltage-gated sodium channels, assuming this is a action potential that's dependent on sodium. And if enough of them open together with this stimulus, we are gonna now trigger a regenerative process where we're gonna open up more and more sodium channels. And so that gives us here this depolarization phase and we're getting close to the equilibrium potential for sodium. Notice that the current for sodium due to the opening of those voltage gated sodium channels is greater than the outward potassium current. Now remember that the voltage gated sodium channels inactivate very rapidly. That inactivation gate blocks further entry of sodium. And in addition, as we're depolarizing, we're now getting to the threshold of voltage-gated potassium channels. These are different than the leaky potassium channels. These channels are now going to open up and allow potassium to leave. And now that's limiting our height. And we're starting to go back down. And we call that repolarization, where the outward potassium current is greater in magnitude than the inward sodium current. Remember the sodium current here is near zero because of the inactivation of those voltage gated sodium channels. And now we're having this potassium current dominate and bring us towards the equilibrium potential for potassium. And in some cases, we can have a little bit of an overshoot. We call that a hyperpolarization phase where again, still the potassium current is greater than the sodium current, but it's even a higher conductance at this point because you have the leaky potassium channel conductance plus some of your voltage gated potassium channels. So you're even closer to the EK. And then as those channels close, you go back to the normal resting state where we started. Now, the height of the action potential is limited by the esodium if it's a sodium-based action potential. If you do something to change the esodium, you can do that by changing the concentration of sodium, and you modify the esodium, you could influence the height. Remember, the maximum this could be is the esodium, and it never really achieves that anyway. You could also look at changing the voltage gated potassium channel opening or the inactivation of the sodium channels, those all are mitigating the maximum amplitude here that we reach. So those are all things that you could think about that could alter the amplitude. Also, in terms of the amplitude, assuming you're not doing any of those things, the amplitude is all or nothing. A bigger stimulus does not result in a bigger sized action potential. Instead, you end up with a higher frequency of action potentials. And that is how the stimulus is coded. Now, one other important point 
is that during the action potential, only a tiny amount of ions cross the membrane. So even though we're talking about these fluxes of sodium during the depolarization phase and potassium during the repolarization phase, the actual concentrations change in a negligible way. So it's a very small number relative to the concentrations. But if you keep firing action potentials, you will dissipate those gradients. And fortunately, in the background, we have the sodium potassium ATPase pumps, which hydrolyze ATP, primary active transport, and these maintain the gradient, maintain the ion concentration gradients, and allow you to keep firing action potentials. The sodium potassium pump, even though it's taking three sodium out and two potassium in, is not, is not involved in the repolarization phase. It is too slow to be involved, but it is in the background always working, putting these ions back so you can continue to fire action potentials. If you blocked the sodium potassium pump and you poisoned it, you would initially be able to fire action potentials with no problem. In fact, you could fire lots of action potentials, thousands of action potentials, because a very tiny amount of ions actually cross and you really wouldn't be influencing the concentration. Now, after you fire thousands and thousands and thousands of action potentials and the gradients get more and more dissipated, eventually the membrane potential will go to zero as the sodium and potassium concentrations will be equalized on the outside and inside.